Thank you guys. Thanks all for being here, and thank you, Amy and uh, Isabel and Brett, for the um, this opportunity. Um, this story actually starts probably back when I joined the military and I made that decision to join to pay for my education. I didn't want to put that burden on my parents and I didn't want to be in debt for the rest of my life. So I joined the Army and my relationship with art at the time was relatively superficial and my relationship with the government at the time was very non-existent until you take this oath, right, to defend and uphold the Constitution of the United States, blah, 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 whatever, whatever. And it also didn't mean anything to me, really, until I went to Iraq for my first deployment. And I realized at that point that we weren't really in a war to defend the Constitution or to defend the rights of Americans or, or our homeland, so to speak, or any of those things. It really was one large corporate interest and the government sort of serving that. And it was a very disenchanting experience for me, which made me decide, you know, like, this isn't what I want to do. As a geospatial analyst, I could have made a lot of money in the civilian sector, of course, serving our, like, military industrial complex. But I decided, you know what, the SVA route is actually the route I want to take. So I did my time, did my three years, came to New York, and it was in that experience that I actually probably went through what was the largest culture shock of my life, having been in maybe the most right-wing group of people in the United States, that, where the, the uh, warmongering and fear against the enemy and the desire to go to war in defense of America you know, was something that most people believed in. And then you move to New York, which is you know, incredibly liberal and the very opposite side of that spectrum, and maybe even in a lot of cases just not even aware. And there's a lot of sort of apathy and uh, lack of knowledge in the, in, in the field of what we're doing overseas. And <clears throat> having experienced that sort of juxtaposition, I decided it was really my duty as an individual to stay informed and consume media from as many sources as possible. And you know, like whether it be sort of the, the Fox News right wing, you know, um, propagandistic sort of view, if you will, or, you know, the democracy now, like, route. I, I wanted to inform myself and know as much about everything as I could. And in that process, I stumbled across, you know, this new way of using this drone technology that when I was in the military, there were drones. There was maybe three of them in Iraq, and they were solely used for surveillance and to, you know, follow troops on the ground and give like a third eye in the sky to allow people to know where the enemies were and what was coming up ahead of them. And it was a pretty benign technology. It was great, actually. It like served a very good function. And post my deployment and post my service in the military, it sort of became perverted and turned into this weapon that we, we used to kill people when they were totally unknowingly, you know, attending a wedding or sitting at a cafe. And that to me seemed like, you know, as an American, like sort of growing up in this world where we like, we're, we, we uphold like freedom and justice and liberty and those, you know, notions, which like I said earlier, when I went to Iraq, that sort of destroyed those illusions to me. And it bothered me to see that, you know, we would go forth with this sort of behavior as a country. So I decided post my SVA experience to, um, to make some work that would try to, that would try to engage, you know, the viewer in understanding the context of, you know, our beliefs as a people and the way we actually live. And I created a series of stencils. These are all quotes from the founding fathers, um, Jefferson, Madison, and Adams. These three are. And all of them talk about issues of liberty and justice and freedom and free speech and the press and things of that nature. And the point of this project was for people to see this and read this and think about the way we live today in this country and, and how like the myths of America you know, were, that, we ha that we hold were really seen and how they were written and the, the points of view of those who you know, like started started those, um, those ideas. In conjunction with this project, I started doing what was, what I guess later became to known, came to be known as the drone campaign. 
And this is a series of street signs. As you can see, they look very much like standard Department of Transportation street signs. Um, but the point was to sort of draw attention to the fact that the NYPD at this time was looking to use this technology to surveil this city. They weren't, they weren't in the process of gaining the te technology. They were in the process of speaking with the FAA about the legalities of it and if it was something that they were actually able to do or not. And it was a conversation that was very much under wraps. It wasn't taking place in the public sphere. It wasn't something that anybody was really aware of. And it was only through a FOIA request that a very small, like, free publication, the Gay City News, I think it was, that's handed out on the you know, sidewalks, um, that it was revealed that this, these conversations were taking place. And, you know, as somebody that went to Iraq for all these ideas of liberty and freedom and, like, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, et cetera, et cetera, you know, like, I thought this is a conversation that we really should be having as citizens, right, as members of this community. And if the police are going to be having this, you know, behind closed doors, like, what is my duty as a citizen of this nation, as a resident of this city, and as an artist to try to help draw attention to this and try to help bring this conversation to the forefront and make this a conversation that we're having as opposed to just, you know, policymakers having. Um, I put up about 50 or so of these, and it got a lot of attention through the New Yorker and the media who was inquiring with the NYPD about the legitimacy of it. And as a result, the Counterterrorism Bureau of the NYPD started hunting me down. Uh, I laid low, and then I decided this conversation hadn't really gone anywhere, and it didn't really instill you know, the right type of reaction from the population or conversation in government. So I decided to go back out and do this, which I did on the eve of the UN General Assembly when all the leaders were in town. And these, about 125 of these went up around Manhattan, south of 59th Street. You know, public service announcements about, again, drone use. And I sort of like, you know, use some imagery from like Banksy slash a street sign in Southern California about, you know, immigrants running across the border, like innocent family. <clears throat> and, um, you know, in an attempt again to draw attention. And as you can see, attention was garnered. The NYPD evidence collection team <laughs> came and sent out a task force that morning to take down as many as they could find throughout the city, and, and then the manhunt ensued, and, um, which eventually led to my arrest in my home via search warrant and some pretty drastic charges against me in order to get me to hopefully stop talking about issues that the government doesn't want people talking about. Um, I think that's a good enough introduction to the work. I think I should hand this over to Svetlana. Yeah? Sure. Cool. Uh, so I was really interested in uh, Assam's work when I found out about all that happened to him. And, it's, um, and it comes in a context. The, the arts project at NCAC started in 2000. And this, for you who were maybe out of grade school by then, this was the end of the, the kind of the big uh, decade of the culture wars, the 90s battles in Congress and the public sphere over uh, public funding for the arts. So by 2000, there was kind of, they were petering out. Uh, the NEA was pretty much gutted. It was not funding any controversial work at all. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of organizations doing artistic freedom uh, had closed shop. So, at that point, NCAC uh, took the task. And, um, but censorship changed. On the one hand, um, after the 90s, institutions were becoming more scared, and scared because their funding streams were, were, um, were threatened. So um, there's been this, um, and I'm sure as kind of future artists and present artists, you've noticed that, that there's a kind of trend towards being careful, towards self-censorship on an institutional level. Um, th there are, of course, there are sometimes there are the big scandals that are censorship as we know it. Somebody, a, uh, a politician, wants work removed. That happened with uh, the hide and seek exhibition at the Smithsonian three years ago. It was very high profile, but these are few and far between. We just don't hear that much about explicit censorship as, as we know it, as repression. Um, at the same time, 
I kind of argue in my experience at, uh, uh, at NCAC for the last 14 years, um, that we have more what I'd call a kind of structural pre-censorship not allowing work to even, for you to even think that you could put your work somewhere. And that, to a very high degree, affects public space. You know, if you want to, um, you could put work in a museum, in a gallery space, um, but a public space is, it's both our space, and it's very highly regulated, and also it's very highly owned by, by private companies and individuals. Uh, so we don't have this uh, repression, you created something, then go to jail. You have uh, like the, 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 uh, the imperative, you, you just cannot do this here. You can do it, do it, you know, put it in a drawer, put it in a museum, you can't do it here. Um, so Assam's work made me think again about these issues of public space and whose space is it and how much space is there for public art? Uh, who can access this space that belongs to to all of us, and and then can we uh, maybe we could talk about censorship not as uh, a repression today, but as a kind of regulation and privatization as an effect. Uh, so we have advertising bombarding us from all these private walls and billboards that are surrounding us, but uh, however private they are, they're surrounding the public space, the space we live in, our shared public space but they are all private. Um, and art, whenever it appears in this space, you know, you have a, I don't know when this is from, an ad for, for Greece, it, it, it's treated as a product. And basically, the imperative here is consume, whether it's, whether it's a play, whether it's Coca-Cola, whether it's a, an Olympus camera. No one, nothing asks us to, to think, or nothing asks us to wonder, to question. Um, in a way, we're um, being protected from what uh, John Stuart Mill called um, uh, the malady of thought. You, you cannot really, you, you have to consume, you, you, should not, you should not think, which is great for controlling a population, not really great for democracy. Um, so when a piece of public, uh, of art does um, go out in this public space, and it, uh, it has a message that is perhaps um, a message that's trying to say something relevant about what's going on today. The first thought that people have is, oh, am I offended? So if somebody is inevitably offended, or even um, in, in this case, this was uh, LA Mocha, this was a mural commissioned by uh, Jeffrey Deitch in conjunction with the street art um, exhibit that uh, he had at, at uh, LA MOCA. And uh, Deitch was concerned that um, uh, veterans, there's a veterans hospital across the way and also a Japanese war memorial. So he was concerned that the Japanese um, and the veterans would be offended. Right? But they weren't even complained. So the mural was whitewashed just uh, a not even 24 hours after it was created. Um, and um, so you and I may be chronically offended when uh, we are uh, barraged by, uh, by advertising, you know, always ask, you know, ask to consume tens of thousands of times a day through all the billboards we see. Um, but there are very few complaints that arise around that. You know, if a particular ad has some content one doesn't like, maybe people complain. Uh, but with art, Complaints are very, um, uh, very routine. Um, so our fellow citizens seem very resigned to consumption harassment they face, but suddenly wake up and decide uh, that uh, we're offended when sale is not the primary purpose of the message. Uh, so uh, the problem with public art is that little space is available for it to begin with. Uh, you can get Philippe Verne, the new, the new director of LA MOCA, to give you a wall to show your work, and if he decides nobody's going to be offended, maybe it will stay. You can rent a private billboard, or you can go through the public permits process and have your art installed in those traditionally public spaces that are parks and sidewalks. So, but what are the problems of these? Um, this was a work um, by um, 
uh, Suzanne Opton, and it was um, images of um, soldiers. And uh, that was to be exhibited in 2008 around the two Republican conventions and also in a number of other spaces, making these soldiers that we normally see in uniform very impersonally into actual people. You, you can relate to this as a person. Um, CBS Outdoor, uh, who, uh, who rented the billboards to, uh, for the work to be exhibited, decided, well, um, they, these ads, somebody might deem this too disrespectful to veterans. So they immediately canceled. They canceled uh, the Minneapolis showing, and this is where the Republican National Convention was. They canceled the showing in Miami. They canceled a show in, in Houston. Uh, interestingly enough, the images were in Denver, where the Democratic National Convention was. Um, and the, the posters were also shown in museums. But what's the recourse you have against CBS advertising? And you have to know that it's a handful of companies that own millions of billboards around the country. So if they don't let you, they're not compelled by any First Amendment to show your work. This is a private company. So, and we're dealing increasingly with private companies that are owning this space and deciding what could be there. So, and this is not an only example, but this is one of them. Um, so, uh, what, what's the other, uh, the other avenue? The other avenue is to go and ask, go through the permit process. And um, for instance, uh, Republican uh, conventions, political conventions, Democratic and Republican, are venues uh, where people really want, you know, the, the media spotlight is there, so they want to um, uh, make political messages through art. Um, however, the permit process is so long, uh, the Artists Collective of Ligurano Reese, and they're here, you can ask them questions later, um, had to go through a very long six month process trying to get a permit for this uh, rather large ice sculpture. And they didn't know until weeks before the sculpture was going to be put up whether they had a permit or not. Uh, and that was in Tampa, Florida, the last um, uh, Republican National Convention. So you have a big art project. You have so much planning around it. But you don't know whether the lottery that was instituted by the city will give you a space, whether this space will be at all visible to uh, the constituencies you want to be seen. Uh, and, and, and they managed. They got a permit. And they're well connected. However, a hurricane was going to hit. So the day that this uh, ice sculpture, which is supposed to last for a day, it's, it's melting, as as is the middle class. Um, uh, uh, the hurricane is going to hit, so they say, well, can you let us do it the next day? You, they had a permit. Uh, it's obviously a safe space. But no, the answer was, of course, no. You have to go through the whole permit process. Well, you can't go through the whole permit process. It's the hurricane coming tomorrow. And you have to, uh, you, the sculpture is ready. You want it there. So they did manage to show the sculpture because they're very well, they know the, the, the free speech community, they had connections at the ACLU, and it was a last minute emergency effort. A lot of other artists would not be able to do that. Um, so so we, we have this kind of like structurally artists are almost excluded from um, the public space. It's like you can put it in a gallery, you can put it in a museum. But there is work that depends, like Assam's work, that depends on its meaning uh, on the context of public space. And that is not an art that would get a permit. And I'm not sure that uh, an artist would even ask for a permit. So I kind of want to open up and start a discussion and ask uh, Assam whether you ever asked or were considering asking for a permit. Well, like, what was your thinking? I'm just going to go <coughs> break the law and... It, it, yes, in short, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, did, I did consider, or I thought about the possibility of that, but I recognized, you know, first of all, the cost of paying for the advertising space. Because mm -hmm. the, the space that I took over was Van Wagner. In the second project, the, uh, the drone campaign, sort of fake public service announcement project, that advertising space is all owned by Van Wagner. And I had no means to fund a campaign to take over you know, 120 plus advertising um, units in the city. Yeah. So. Um, so like that, 
first of all, excluded me because it wasn't an option. And secondly, obviously because of the content, I was skeptical of whether something like that would even be approved. I, um, I looked through the process on how you get a permit for some of the banners. You know, there's advertising banners on light posts all over the city. Those are pretty open to the public and almost anybody can get one of those and it's not an incredibly expensive fee. You just have to get the design approved by the city. And naturally the city is not going to approve this design where I'm posing as somebody that I'm not and you know, like portraying a relatively authoritarian message. Um, so I didn't even think it would, was worth the process. I, um, to me the only natural next step was to just hijack it and take it on my own and, uh, and see what transpired Were you expecting after. consequence? Like, well, what was your thinking of like, the risks that you were taking? I in no way thought that the counterterrorism division of the NYPD was gonna come after me. I mean, I assumed that there would be some consequence, but you know, I, I talked to a few street artists that had done similar things, and I researched other street artists that have taken over that advertising space and that have also put up fake street signs. Again, none of them as politically charged as my work, but the consequences that they suffered are at maximum, you know, a, a misdemeanor sort of, you know, vandalism or, you know, v vandalism yeah. charge. So to me, that seemed like, okay, like a $250 ticket, you know, like that's not that big of a deal. That's probably a consequence I can deal with. Can, can you talk about your charges? Because you, uh, you didn't even get a vandalism charge. No, my charges were much more severe than that. I was charged with grand larceny for taking the advertisements out of the space that previously existed, which is a felony. Possession of stolen property for possessing the advertisements that I took out of the <laughs> advertisement <laughs> space um, and possessed for as long as it took me to throw them in the garbage can. Um, <laughs> And um, possession of a, a forged instrument, criminal possession of a forged instrument, which is for the NYPD logo that's on all of them, <coughs> which is, that's actually a statute that's designed to punish people for fake IDs, fake credit cards. It's more of a, um, a financial fraud protection. Um, that's a misdemeanor, though they hit me with 56 counts of that misdemeanor. Um, it's for every poster or like what's Yeah, I guess for every poster that they found. I'm not sure. I mean, there's two per poster and I put up 120 of them, so I'm not really sure where 56 comes from, but I'm assuming that the police actually only took down 56 and the remainders right. were, um, were retrieved by Van Wagner when they went on their cycle to change ads. So um, what was the reaction of the audience? Did you get, you know, because Putting it in public space, you obviously want people to react in, mm. a, in a way that's kind of, well, confused between right. is this a real NYPD ad? Were they confused? And how they it's funny because it's a hard metric to, to measure, you know? I, um, I didn't really know how, when I started the project, when I started the street signs, I didn't really know how I was going to figure out how people were reacting to this. I actually went months without yeah. even having read anything except for the own interview that I did with the New Yorker, until my cousin was like, there's a lot of news about these street signs, like you should really look this up. And I was like, well, what are you looking up? Like, what are you doing? She's like, just Google, just Google NYPD drone strike zone or something. I was like, oh wow, interesting tool. <laughs> um, and, and that's sort of when I learned, you know, that there was a lot of discussion and a lot of questioning going on was to A, the legitimacy of the signs and the billboards, and B, whether that was a program that people wanted. And there were people from both sides of the argument, and it was actually really refreshing to see a dialogue. And it, it kind of mostly manifested itself in like comment feeds and, and on things like Reddit, uh, where people actually communicate. Um, but there's people that, I've, that were they were taking the side of this obviously isn't going to be used to kill people, this is a surveillance thing, and then you know that sort of went off on a conversation about whether surveillance is something that we want in our everyday life. Um, there was an instance with the, with the street signs before the public service announcements where I went to photograph one of them, and I went with a model and I wanted to create you know, sort of a, you know, a higher end image than what is on the web. And I sort of staged this image of somebody like reacting to the drone in the sky. It was actually one of the images that I showed. Uh, and as I'm walking up, you know, I have an assistant and I have the model and I've got cameras and lighting equipment and we're walking up to the street sign in Dumbo. 
this car is pulling in to park and he pulls up slowly and he stops and I'm like, hold on guys, like just, can I just watch this for a second? <laughs> <laughs> and this guy gets out of his car and he walks around and he looks at the sign and he looks up and this is at the base of the Manhattan Bridge so I mean it's not like there's not gonna like is there a drone right there you know I don't, um, <laughs> and he's looking around and we walk up and he's like do you see this and I was like yeah I do and he's like what is that and I was like I don't know that's actually what I'm here to photograph it's pretty interesting right and he's like I can't believe this if this is real this is crazy and his wife was in the passenger seat and she's like what what's going on and he's like apparently the New York City Police Department has drones and she's like what's a drone he's like it's what they're using to kill people in Pakistan and I was just I was like I was trying so hard to like keep in my laughter because this was a pretty interesting moment you know to see somebody react and think it was real and it sort and it was to be honest the exact reaction that I was looking for because this man is now like hopefully would go home and like talk to his wife about it talk to his family about it go online research about it and next time something is said you know with hit within his community of influence you know he's now going to have an opinion and well, on something that we never had an opinion on before so it's been interesting to watch people. yeah and the media has really helped yeah, the media's definitely helped. <laughs> so have, have you ever considered putting hidden cameras on the work or to see the reactions? The, yeah, the idea has crossed my mind. It would be, it, it would be an interesting um, experiment. I don't think logistically it's possible, really, or financially for me, to be honest. Um, there are these like security apparatus that large companies have in their parking lots that are basically light posts that are equipped with cameras and they have digital screens that will show feedback of what the camera is seeing if it feels that something illegal is taking place like it has this sort of a, you know like the ability to analyze what's going on in its you know purview and then a alarm the people that are possibly committing a crime it's very strange they're very expensive units but i think there there's possibility for quite interesting yeah. work with those <laughs> uh, so kind of to, to capitalize on your background as a geospatial analyst and knowing the other side of things, do, do you think it's actually likely that drones will soon be watching us? Do you, like, from I think it's very likely. I mean, we already have the technology. Right now, there's um, something called Argus, which is an imaging technology that's used on the Global Hawk. And the Global Hawk is the largest um, you know, unmanned drone that the United States military has. And it's essentially an array of s camera sensors that are no bigger than like your iPhone camera sensor, but a large array of them. And it has the ability to monitor an entire city to the detail of watching people simultaneously. And now it's an incredible amount of bandwidth, an incredible amount of storage, and nobody's actually watching that 24-7 because that's far too much information. But I mean, that te technology already exists and is being utilized overseas. Hmm. So, I mean, it could easily be happening over New York and we would never know it. That f aircraft flies at 30,000 feet. Yeah, I was just like, you know, I, I wanted to um, kind of open the discussion to this issue of invisibility and visibility. And um, my question as we discuss is not that clear on that issue, but it seems that um, on the one hand, we have this, you know, the drones, we have the NSA, we have surveillance, we have this total visibility and our uh, resistance to it. Um, on the other hand, you know, you're the artist kind of invisible behind the scene, and while you're invisible, uh, the New Yorker is after you, and they really want to find who you are, and when you become more visible, they're not that interested. Mm -hmm. um, the, the kind of, so there is, you want to like, there's this, always this search to make the invisible visible, after which it, it stops being interested, maybe it mm -hmm. becomes too predictable afterwards. Um, but also kind of as a, as a corollary to that, you know, our uh, deliberate making ourselves visible through social media, through casting all this private information online, and maybe a kind of exhibitionist desire for visibility for, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm visible, people know me, I'm on Facebook, I'm, you can Google me and I exist, if you Google me I don't exist, mm. where am I, do I exist at all? So how, like, wh wh what are your thoughts on, on those issues? <laughs> well, I think, <clears throat> I mean, we live just in that paradigm 
where everything that we don't know is of interest to us. I think, I don't, I mean, I, I've only been around for 30 years, so I can't speak <laughs> for all of human history, but it seems like that's something that's just built in. Like, we want to know about what we don't mm -hmm. know about. And, and once we do find out, like the media, they don't care anymore. They found out, oh, whatever, next. It's like, they're on this news cycle. Like, they have money on the line, and they're trying to maintain, you know, like, their advertising dollars so that they can continue to spew the same thing that every other channel is spewing, right? So I don't necessarily know that they're the best gauge for you know, what is interesting and what isn't based on visibility and invisibility. Um, though to the point of social media, there is a very voyeuristic tendency in our society and the world nowadays with things like Instagram and, and Facebook and everything and selfies and whatever. Um, but I think we've gotten to a point where we're not even interested in that anymore, too. You know, like, it's all visible now. Like, do I really care about, you know, like, my friend's Instagram's account? Like, not really. You know what I mean? Like, do they really care about mine? Probably not. Um, so, you know, I don't know. The, 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 that's a, it's an odd didactic. I think Amy wants to say something. Yeah. When, when I first met you, um, it was kind of shortly after you had been arrested and you had all these issues and your story had just kind of come out in the media and everything and I was very interested in your story and I was trying to talk to some of my friends in the art press about writing about you to try to get you some support for your case and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and one of the things I kept hearing over and over again and I thought this related to what Devadlano was talking about, uh, visibility versus invisibility, what I kept hearing from journalists that I was approaching about this was, well, if the poor guy didn't want to get caught, why did he sign his name on all the posters? <laughs> and people, I found that people were like really holding that against you, like as an artist, like that was a really big wall that I kept sort of hitting, was like people would look at the posters and there is a little kind of stylized signature mm -hmm. in it. And for some reason, a bunch of, you know, some of the people I talked to, that like ruined the credibility of the project. Um, and it doesn't for me personally, but I thought it was an interesting thing about sort of the identity of the artist and, and sort of relating to all this. And I, I guess I was really curious as to why you did incorporate your signature or something identifying of you in something that's clearly an illegal project. Mm -hmm. Like, well, were you asking for it is I guess what the, are yeah, and uh, there's been a couple articles that have actually s said that in their title, you know, like that I was asking for it. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess I chose, well, first of all, I think, well, I guess I chose to use the, uh, the Assam sort of moniker because I originally for all of the work before, I had sort of just done this sort of abstracted E and it had no way of being identified. You know, like in literature, when people are writing about something, you know, like they don't have, like it's like, it's a shape, you know, and they didn't even identify it with a letter, so how do you write about that, you know? And the E was short for Assam, and it's, it is my first initial, and it's a name that I don't really go by, nor does anybody know me by it until now, nor is it on any of my paperwork, really, for that matter. So I, to be totally honest, with outside of the military, didn't think that it would, it would come back to me in that way. And at, that, at the point that I had made that decision, the, all of the dots that the police needed to connect were already out in the press. You know, like they had the, my age, where I was from, where I lived, where I went to school, what job I had in the military. You know, like there aren't many people that fit that profile. You know, so I, at that point I was like, if they know who I am, they know who I am by now. It doesn't really matter. Let me give them something to at least, let me give like the world or whatever, like people that want to talk about this, something to at least write mm -hmm. so that there can be a real conversation instead of like the artist formerly known as Prince with, you know what I mean? Like that you can't actually identify. No, but, but it's interesting about, you know, kind of the artist and anonymity in the contemporary world because you're part of the art world, the art market, and you really need to be not only visible, you need to be branded, you really work towards visibility. Mm. At the same time, like, could you be like an interventionist artist that is really anonymous? I mean, even, you know, Banksy, how the style Banksy is very recognizable as Banksy. 
uh, is, it, is it possible to surrender that ego and be an anonymous, a medieval anonymous artist? Yeah, as in our political intervention. I mean, I think well. it is. I think it's difficult. Um, to that, to that point and your point previous, I do believe that um, street art in general like has credibility based on anonymity. You know, like when when street artists like are come out and their their no their their moniker is exchanged with their real name or their pseudonym exchanged with their real name, whatever. You know, for some reason it doesn't work for the the collectors and the people that like operate in that community as well for some reason with the press and within the community. You know, I've been to many street art events and met a lot of these people and, and they still, they need that anonymity and that separation between their real identity and their street art identity, even if their face isn't anonymous. Mm -hmm. And for, so I don't know, there's something subconscious about that context in street art that people like to separate. Um, like coming back to like the general issue of visibility and visibility, I, you know, kind of my theory is that you know, we, we need to start distinguishing and talking about kinds of visibility. And one is a kind of the visibility of the panopticon, which is, you know, we're all visible to an entity that is opaque to us. So the government, we don't know what they're doing, but they're seeing us. Or we don't know what Google is doing, they're seeing us. And then the visibility that we are seeking, you know, whether in social media or person to person, is a kind of visibility as an individual, a, record, a type of recognition. The other one is a visibility of control, the panopticon, and this is about recognition. But, but we, we hear about this, you know, we, we have this uh, narrative of dystopia, and we're talking about, you know, public space being taken over by advertising and the, 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 uh, the ask to consume. We're being all under surveillance. And it seems like we, we've been there. We've been there with George Orwell. We've been there with Aldous Huxley. Uh, and we're living this narrative. Um, and my, my unanswerable question to Sam was like, can, can we change this narrative? Can we, and, and you guys are artists, you know, we, you, you, you change the story. Can we change that story rather than kind of, you know, live the dystopia and perpetuate the dystopia? Can we imagine uh, a different future, whether this is not the case? And the different future is, we're not going to go to, you know, the times when we didn't have surveillance technologies. We're not going to go to the times pre-drones and, you know, I think you're telling me Amazon is testing drones now as delivery system. And I you know, I, don't I do my Amazon delivery. For the I record, I don't think that's ever gonna take place for the yeah, record. Really? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was thinking oh, when making some, some order on Amazon, it would be so great if I, if I, I, I needed like a, a, a pot the other day. And I thought, if I could get it in an hour, <laughs> it would be so great. E eBay so, now can get it to you in an hour and it's a human being on a bicycle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be cheaper. <laughs> so again, like, well, what's our positive, what's our utopian narrative that does include, you know, all these technologies and drones? It's not like, you know, we, we want to build Luddites because, you know, technology is there to stay. But c can we offer something that, that's different? Or is it all a doomsday scenario? I mean, you I don't... Can, you can ask for help from the audience. <laughs> yes. Help. No, um, I don't necessarily think it's a doomsday scenario. I think in order for us to, to transition to a point where we as a culture and a society and a species are accepting of that, we, we're going to have to not only like live the life that we live on Facebook where we sort of let people sort of see in our lives, but I feel like we would have to really live in the open and really have no secrets and really embrace honesty. Because, I mean, as it is, I mean, you Sounds mentioned the, good. what's that? Sounds good. Um, embrace honesty? Yeah, yeah, but people like their own, like their own solitude. You know, I do. I like being in my apartment and not having everybody know in the world what I'm doing and where, you know, and why I'm doing it. And, you know, sometimes I'm not doing anything. I'm just in bed all day. You know, but like, that's not something that people want to like show the world, you know? Um, but to the panopticon, no, am I even saying that right? I don't even, the, this prison design? Like that, I think we sort of live in that world already a little bit, right? I mean, it being a design where you can be watched at any point but not knowing when you're being watched is sort of where we live now. And I think Edward Snowden has helped reveal that and Thomas Drake before him has helped reveal that. And you know, Julian Assange with all of his revelations with WikiLeaks, you know, like we, 
we really do live in a place where, I mean, this conversation could be listened to by everybody, like through all of the points in this room, you know, through their phones unknowingly, you know, through their cameras unknowingly, through, I don't know if there's security cameras in here, but through that network. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and in order for us to sort of embrace that, I think we have to get past our notions of just get past the ideas of privacy and security and sort of embrace the idea that we're all just going to live totally exposed because I think that's where it's headed. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of conflict. I tend to think the conflict route is the way we're going to go, but. Well, we are having a conflict, but it's, <laughs> it's not very big a response. So I, I want to open this to the audience and, and you, can, uh, you can answer my question about the utopian narrative that includes surveillance or uh, you know, ask SM questions or ask me questions. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, clearly you're not in jail right now. So mm -hmm. how was that whole situation resolved or not resolved? And also another question is, could you speak more a, li a little bit more about the relationship between doing work like this, street art, or like work that does not, or that you don't seek permission for, mm -hmm. so-called, and um, you know, how that kind of, you know, traditionally adds to this romance of what street art is and what it tries to represent, and whether like you accept as a street artist or as someone who makes art in this way, um, do you accept the fact that you have to face consequences? To the first part of the question, I'm actually still out on bail as we speak. It's been, this court proceeding has been going on for over a year. Um, and, you know, at the behest of my attorney, I have sort of let it drag on that long in hopes that it will sort of get swept under the rug. That is yet to be seen. Um, in terms of the consequences of street art and its, my exception, I mean, yes, yes is the short answer. I've definitely accepted it. I, I, I'm fighting it the best I can because I know that there are, our legal system doesn't actually support justice. It supports, you know, money and connections. So, you know, I'm trying to exploit that route. Um, but if for whatever reason, like, I'm sp I mean, I spent 30 hours in jail. That was an unpleasant experience. And nor do I want to repeat it. But I think... I think the, the medium is maybe the best way to communicate with the largest segment of the population. It's sort of why I chose this versus, the, you know, like the gallery route or, you know, like I, most galleries, I mean, I guess I haven't really exploited that route at all, but um, <clears throat> I don't imagine this is a conversation that would work well in that, in that sort of world. Um, and not only do I not imagine it would work well or be well accepted, but it also would be communicating with a very narrow segment of the, of the population. A, one that's probably already intellectually on the same page and already knows this is going on and you know, maybe feels helpless or maybe doesn't care or maybe they're you know, in their own world. But you know, B, they, it's just 0.100% you know, of the population. And I think at I think that the consequence that I face for communicating with you know, the possibility of millions of people is, is worth it, yes. Um, so just for people that may be considering um, this type of work or doing something with this sort of, uh, to get this sort of a reaction, um, what is it like? Like you said, you, you're in court for like a year now. Um, like what is it like to live that, live those consequences? Um, <clears throat> to repeat the question, if anybody didn't hear, he was asking what it's like to live those consequences. Uh, for me, it's been relatively benign. I mean, I did have all of my digital media taken from me, my computer, my hard drives, my tablet, my, you know, every, whatever, you name my laptop. So, like, as a photographer, you know, like, in, like, you know, working in that world, it sort of destroyed that career for a year because all of that work is gone and I haven't been able to retrieve that since. Um, so it's, there's, there are challenges, but I mean, I think you as an individual make the choice to overcome those challenges or like succumb to the depression that they may, you know, like, you know, instill. And my choice was to get another computer and like keep working and, you know, like get, have a fundraiser and make things happen to try to get out of the problem. 
as opposed to just you know face four felonies and go to jail for eight years and you know like be on probation for six you know like it could have very much ruined my life but I think you know like you have the ability to manipulate the situation in your favor if that answered the well, question I think you're no letter is going to trial or not <laughs> <laughs> true I just had, a, I had another question. Um, mm -hmm. How different do you think the public reception to your case would be if, say, George Bush were still president versus Obama being president? Um, and I also wonder the same for an organization like NCAC in terms of, um, I don't really want to talk about like fundraising, so to speak, but in terms of just public interest, are people sort of paying more attention when there's a Republican in the White House versus when there's a Democrat? Do people tend to get a little complacent and think like, oh, well, everything's going to be okay now. We've got a Democrat in there. Um, or, or what? I mean, I, I tend to think that if George Bush were in, in, in office still, that this would be a much larger conversation. Even though Obama has been a much worse um, executor of this power than Bush ever dreamed of being, but I do think there is a complacency within the population for sure. Well, yeah, I agree that that uh, uh, that Obama is not getting enough pushback from his own constituency. Um, but in terms of our success, uh, I, when, when Bush got the presidency our uh, donations went up. Yeah, so people were definitely concerned. Um, however, um, they now know better about Obama too. So especially with surveillance, I think uh, we, we've had um, kind of a rising concern in the US about civil liberties. And uh, it's not uh, unfounded, uh, but people, um, uh, kind of people I talk to are, are, are very concerned that we are uh, really stepping away from the Constitution and from what we believe to be our inherent rights. And, and that is specifically around uh, surveillance and privacy, but these are very connected to free speech because if you know, and, and we know that we've all changed our behaviors online. If you know you're being watched all the time, if you want, know that all this data is being collected, I'm not going to say certain things in my email. I grew up in, on the other side of the Iron Curtain in Bulgaria, so I've known from day one that you just don't say everything. <laughs> uh, and I'm a little um, kind of, you know, I think, oh, the Americans are so naive. <laughs> you think that <laughs> this was suddenly this emergency. Yes, of course we were under surveillance, and of course it didn't start today. There are revelations about FBI legal um, uh, uh, observation and, uh, in 1971. And we tend to forget these things and we need Edward Snowden again. But this is an ongoing issue and it crosses administrations. It's not like, you know, and, and this is one of the issues that kind of reveals how little difference there is between uh, Republicans and Democrats. Um, uh, so um, uh, I think people have been waking up to, to that. I hope so. <laughs> Have you always like triggered these kind of things through like your art school, or have uh, like, what triggered actually doing attacking these issues and stuff like that? If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, I, of course it does. Um, I th again, I think it was born out of that the, my military experience and how disillusioning that was to me, and uh, and then moving to New York and seeing this totally different world that you know contradicted everything that I had learned up until that point and my desire to just seek information. And the more information I sought out, the more confused I was and the more questions I had and the more conflicting I feel like every media story that I read is. And, and so it made me decide that maybe like as an artist, and reading people like you know, Camus and things like that and their, their, their image of what an artist's duty is to society is sort of was an influence as well. And as somebody who is, you know, A, an American, and B, served in the military, and, and now sort of subscribes to that, like, existentialist view of what art serves, you know, like, I felt like I had to do something, you know, or had to at least help try to participate in the system a little bit more than, you know, buying things at Walmart and banking at Bank of America, you know? Um, does that answer the question? Sorry. <laughs> the question is, 
whether Sam will be doing the, this kind of art after the situation is resolved one way or another. And to, that's honestly a good question that I'm not sure I have an answer to at the moment. One, because this is being recorded and going to be on the internet before the case is completed. <laughs> and um, never and two, because I mean, it's been a year of my life that I've been dealing with this, and it's been a huge financial burden. And you know, so if I were to do this, would I do it in the same way? No. Do I do think that large public works sort of projects that engage large audiences are valuable, and is that the direction that I would like to go? Absolutely. How, how I go about that, doing that is probably going to change, but do I want to continue working in a, in a, in a similar medium? Yes. First of all, um, you thought that you were disenchanted. Uh, you, you lost your illusion about uh, the United States of North America when you was in the military and during Afghanistan and all that. Mm. Uh, where did you get that illusion in the first place? That's my first question. Um, do you get it via socialization, your family, values, the school system? Where the illusion to begin with? Like the, yeah. the, like I think the, the illusion that all taught that illusion in school, right? You, we go through this educational system that you know, speaking of censorship, like the textbook editing process is horrendous, you know, and by the time you get information, it's so diluted. And, you know, we're taught to believe America is great, right? We're the land of the free. We, we live in a free country. Yada, like all of those sort of colloquialisms of what America is. And, and also about the war, about the war being for this cause against, you know, an evil regime with weapons of mass destruction and payback for what was done to us. And... You know, and then I travel there and I realize that I don't even have a job because all of the jobs that the military are supposed to do are being done by contractors that are being paid 10 times what I'm being paid. You know, and you know, that's the taxpayer's money. You know, that's us in this room, like paying those wages, paying my wage as well, but my wage is being paid for me to sit around, whereas, you know, people are getting paid to do the same thing that I'm trained to do for. $150,000 to $250,000 a year versus my measly 47 or something, you know, like slave wage. Um, <laughs> so that was one of them. Um, the media played a huge role as well. I, I was privileged in my first four months of being in Iraq where I sat on the Joint Operations Center floor where General Casey at the time, the theater commander of the war, got his morning briefing every day. This huge amphitheater with many, many desks from every department of the military and every career, and like everything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and they all give a briefing. And I was there to like provide map products for the guys that needed them to go on, you know, one of the many large screens for the briefings. And I would see these briefings and I would sit through it and I would and I was privileged to a fair amount of information. And then I would immediately after see the news reports on what's going on. And the news reports are on the next screen. You know, like there's three huge movie theater size screens. And one of them has like five subdivisions of every, BBC, NBC, CNN, Fox, you know, whatever else. And you have headphones with a switchboard and you can choose what you're listening to. And, and everything was a lie. Everything. You know, maybe the date, the time, the number of rounds, and the number killed was like accurate. And or the direction someone was traveling. Everything else was false. And it really blew my mind. And that was actually one of the biggest things that like, it hit me hard. And I was like, what is going on? Like, where am I living? And what is this like, sort of like, vortex that I've been sucked into? Thank you for that. My second question is, do you have a political bias? Or do you want to plan to? I don't think that belongs to a party, but to a movement or something no, I don't by think yourself. No. I mean, I think I probably most identify with like the libertarian ideology, but I don't personally identify with the party at all because I don't think it serves the function of conversation. Like, mm -hmm. what ends up happening is people become polarized on the party mm -hmm. as opposed to talking about ideas. Exactly. You know, we don't actually have real conversations in this country about, you know, about taxes and about, you know, the Second Amendment and about free speech. We talk about really superficial things and that you know like that aren't that shouldn't really even be in the the discourse of government in, in a lot of cases in my view so no i don't affiliate myself with the party
Uh, this is a more technical question. How did you style the signs? How did I style them? Yeah, is, is a style. No, no, not the Photoshop process, but to put them on the on the on the boards. Oh, so what I what I went out and did is is I took a sign down mm -hmm. to find out the material that it was made of, mm -hmm. and I just I reproduced that. I went around to print houses to figure out because I was like, what is this? I've never seen this. Like I've printed on a lot of substrates as a photographer, but this was like this plastic sort of thing, and um, you know found out what the material was, and I and I basically had it printed in the same manner. You know, I designed it and sent it to a commercial sign manufacturer who prints advertising that goes in these signs. And he, they already have the specs for it and everything because this is what they do. So they di you didn't put them by, by yourself on the streets? I they did put them. them by myself. I had them printed by the people mm -hmm. that print real and How ones. can you remove the, the old one and put the new one? Just a screwdriver? Oh, that easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the tip. I mean, it's sort of like it's a safety. So they're all different, but mm -hmm. they're mostly tools that you can buy um, at the hardware store. Mm. So it's not like safety hex bits and things like that. Yeah. The ones on the subway and the mm -hmm. bus station ones, the big ones, those are difficult. Those need a special okay. tool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. Then I have one. Can you summarize the rest of your 50 questions into like one? Yeah, um, OK. Yeah, that was more separate. No, it's mainly about fear, about censorship, about self-censorship, even in this time, knowing that it's recorded. Uh, is that, do you think that we have never really get out of that state of, like you well mentioned, of uh, the Orwellian future? Do you think that we have never been able even to get out of that situation? Before of that was the Inquisition, before of that was the Church, or the figure of God, there was always an all-seeing eye watching towards us. Now we know that it's an actual thing. And do you think, how can we do as artists to face that? Yeah, I don't know if I'm intelligent enough to answer that question. No, I'm <laughs> um, As far as history is concerned, do I think we were ever in a place where there wasn't? Probably not. I think it's always been varying degrees of surveillance. Mm -hmm. I think with the advent of digital technology, it's more invasive. Um, you know, under other authoritarian regimes, there actually maybe there actually needed to be a person, you know, watching in the past, or maybe a camera. You know, you needed to be with an eye shot or something, or like with. But now that we all have a camera on us and we all have a microphone on us, it's sort of changed that paradigm drastically. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that we are much farther from a place where we live like free and you know, non-surveilled lives than we ever were. But yes, that always did sort of exist. I mean, all the way back to the founding of this country, we've had huge infringements of our privacy and liberty based all because of fear and war. So no, has it ever not existed? Not in my opinion. Um, to the role of the artist, I mean, I think that, I think that has to do more with you and how you define art. You know, like I define art as something that engages people and helps shift consciousness and creates conversation and you know like some people define art as something that's pretty on the wall you know and some people define art that's you know like a, a, a conversation of their emotional process with a uh, with something and there's many ways to define that uh, and I think that's probably up to you and your responsibility like I take the more you know like social responsibility route but I think that comes from other places as well, you know? Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. So with the degree of oppression that exists within this nation today, um, there seems to be a huge amount of pacification, especially for what you label left, um, the youthful left. There seems to be a high degree of pacification. They're very, in my mind, sort of soft. Um, and there's a more militant side to what you claim is right. What would you say to the youth that exists on the left today? Um, why is there so much pacification? Why are they so afraid? And um, because the drone is such a hot topic, especially if you don't live in this nation, um, if you live somewhere in the Middle East, if you live in Oman, if you live in Pakistan, um, Yemen, if you live somewhere like that, it's a very hot topic because obviously you know someone typically that's been affected by it. Mm. Do you feel like you pushed the boundaries enough with what you did? And 
Would you be willing to do it again and to what degree? Um, to answer the first question, um, <clears throat> well, no, sorry, second question, the boundaries. Uh, <laughs> I, as far as what's going on in, in other countries and the drone being a hot topic, I, to me it serves a little bit more as a, as a symbol of authoritarianism in general. You know, it, it A is a weapon, it's B, surveillance, so I think it's a good vehicle to have m all of those conversations. You know, the conversation of sort of the military industrial complex that we, the paradigm that we live in, the conversation of sort of unjust, you know, wars and, and the way in which we weaponize technology, um, the conversation of sort of unknown surveillance, you know, it, it sort of fits a lot of bills, you know, that go along with what we as a nation are doing in general. And, I, and to me, it's kind of the ultimate symbol. Um, as far as whether I do it again and whether I think it, I push the boundaries enough, I'm going to refrain from answering whether I do it again, because this is being broadcast somewhere. <laughs> um, I think I push the boundaries just enough, you know, like I think the boundary could be pushed more, you know, and I think there's always more, there's more work that can be done and there's, the conversation can be brought to another level. But to be honest, with, to be honest, like my goal in the very beginning was just to get like a major media outlet to talk about it. And, and it didn't take long, I mean I wasn't even done a 25% of like the work of the first series of signs before that started to happen. And it sort of snowballed to a point where I was no longer able, like, in control of what was going on. And it, like, and it scared me, you know? Um, and I, because I didn't know where it was going to go from there. It became sort of its own animal. And I just had to sit back and watch and see what happened. Um, sorry, can you repeat the first part of that? I, it just. Uh -huh. They're going from $35 to $80 a day. Right. They, they burn the street. Right. So oh, yeah, pacification in the yeah, youth of America, a right. Strong leftist youth movement there. There's a lot of cohesiveness amongst the youth that you don't belong to your group. And what I'm asking is, what would you say would be the needed motive to relinquish the pacification that exists within the nation? I think people. I think people need to learn that they have power as an individual, you know, that they as an individual can actually affect dialogue and actually affect and, and you know, manifest and instill change, not only in other people, but in their state, country, and, you know, in the world. Um, I don't think we, for the most part, are taught that we can really do that and that we really have that power. I think on the flip side of that, we're terrified of it for the exact re for, for what happened to me, you know, like, and for what happened to Snowden, and for what happened to Julian Assange, and I, I mean. Right, but how many people were arrested during Occupy Wall Street? I mean, hundreds, the very large numbers of people were arrested. Um, and I don't know if that's like, I mean, like, there are other regimes, like, genocide has taken place, you know, when people don't do what countries want them to do, and I don't really think we need to take it there, but I do think it could go there, you know? But um, I, think, I think people are just afraid, A, and B, because as an individual, there are serious consequences. And B, they're not really in tune with what they have the ability to do. You know, we have abilities as, individual and, as individuals, and I would hope that at least this is a little bit of a lesson to that, you know? And last question. So you work in a vein that other artists work in, like Pussy Riot and uh, Trevor Paglin or Ai Weiwei. Mm. And um, eventually, their art becomes commodified, and uh, it becomes something that can be collected. So um, ideally, that will happen to you. And the people that are buying your art um, may be bankers at Bank of America. But maybe they want to participate in this conversation as well. Do you welcome your work in that context? Sure. I mean, if they're willing to participate in that conversation. I mean, I sold, during the mentor show, like when I, 
I sold my work. My work was very critical of the establishment, you know, and I ended up selling the piece to an incredibly wealthy London banker, you know, which I thought was really ironic. You know, I was talking about, you know, the, how media manipulates people and how the banking industry like runs the world, and this guy's like, yeah, that's great. I want that. <laughs> you know, and I was like, I was blown away, you know, and I was like, so, I mean, yeah, sure, I'll take their money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add, uh, do you think that they buy to hide, hide it from the public, to hide, hide, the, hide your art? Like, uh, like if your art is like provocative, do you think that this wealthy people, that their interest is to buy your art so they hide it from the public? I would never would have thought of that. No, I mean, I, I think that's, that, would, that would be quite a conspiracy amongst <laughs> amongst the, the upper 1% of America to buy critical art just, in, just to hide it. I mean, I suppose it's possible, anything's possible, but I don't necessarily think that that's true. <laughs> well, they're buying it. They're so. <laughs> <laughs>